Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a special thank you to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Brooks. Uh, just a few house rules to keep in mind as we get started. Uh, please keep your audio off all time. And uh, please keep your camera off. Save your questions until the end. Uh, if you have any questions for our guest speaker during the presentation, you may ask in the chat box area, and I'll be happy to forward those questions to our guest speaker towards the end. Uh, please be respectful and enjoy. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks, Aya. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, as I have said, my name is Elizabeth Brooks. Um, today I'm going to talk about the rise in virtual behavioral health care. This presentation will last about six, uh, 30 minutes with an opportunity to answer um, questions at the end of the session. And as I have mentioned, this presentation will be recorded. So to begin, the demand for virtual mental health care is soaring. And what do we do to meet that demand? As the impact of the pandemic on mental health continues, psychologists are reporting a large increase in the demand for treatment of anxiety and depression compared with last year. And this is according to a survey, survey by the American Psychological Association. Many psychologists are also saying that they have had increased workloads and longer wait lists than before the pandemic. With these indicators suggesting that many psychologists are working at or beyond capacity, more than four in 10 or 41% report being unable to meet the demand for treatment. And that's up 30% from last year. And 40%, 46% said that they felt burned out. And that's up about 41% from last year. Excuse me. Pandemic. The pandemic has led to a switch to telehealth for many psychologists, and virtually all clinical psychologists continue to provide at least some in-person services remotely, um, while few have returned to seeing patients entirely in person since a year ago. Sorry, was there a question? Perfect. Okay, so few people have, a uh, few psychologists have returned to seeing patients entirely in person since a year ago. A greater number of psychologists have adopted what we call a hybrid approach to seeing some patients, and that's seeing them both in person and some remotely. And this is revealing a slow pr uh, progression back to the office. So how do we scale mental health care to meet the increased demand? In this webinar, we'll go over the following. Telehealth adoption post COVID-19, latest industry trends, and innovation in healthcare. So we're looking at the digital mental health era. Telehealth represented less than 1% of outpatient care before the pandemic, rounding to about zero for mental health, substance use, and other concerns. However, at its pandemic peak, telehealth represented about 40% of mental health and substance use outpatient visits and 11% of other visits. And this is during the March to August 2020 period. Since then, in-person care has returned and telehealth visits have dropped off to represent 5% of other outpatient visits, that is, visits without a mental health or a substance use claim. And this was during the March uh, to August 2021 period. However, telehealth use has remained strong for mental health and substance use treatment, still representing about 36% of these outpatient visits. The success of digital mental health startups means that more people can access mental wellness than were potentially able to do so before. Broadly, the digital mental health space includes direct-to-consumer apps, such as Talkspace and Calm, apps that are designed for 
clinician to prescribe, such as RESET, and that's used to treat substance use disorders, and also mental health platforms that work with employers and health plans, such as Ginger, Lyra Health, and Modern Health. There's more than 380,000 health apps that are available through the Android and the um, uh, Apple platforms, and around 20,000 of them address mental health. And this is according to the European Connected Health Alliance. But how do mental health professionals feel about these apps? Let's talk about the benefits of digital mental health to help answer this question. Telehealth is a safe and convenient option for getting mental behavioral health care at home. You may be able to attend appointments without um, needing transportation, taking time off of work, or even arranging for childcare. And these factors can be very important in a long-term treatment plan. Telemental health, that is delivering care remotely and sometimes over great distances, it's making it possible to bring life-changing services to populations who previously may not may have act, uh, excuse me, may have lacked access to them. Many behavioral health services are available remotely. So virtual visits can be a very convenient way to access things like one-on-one -on -one therapy, group therapy, talk therapy, addiction counseling, medication prescribing medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorders, medication monitoring, mental health screening, referrals, and finally, anxiety and depression monitoring. So lots of different types of services are available. Um, now, what can you expect from virtual appointments? Most telehealth appointments are video calls that are on a computer, a tablet, or even a smartphone. And behavioral health appointments may also include voice calls or text messages. Smartphone apps can also be used in behavioral health care. These can include digital, digital tools for monitoring your health, such as tracking your moods, and other apps may be available to help you improve behavioral health outside of traditional appointments, such as apps that help with guided meditations. So, Prepare for your visit um, by finding a quiet place for your appointment. And it needs to have a reliable internet connection. And you need to make sure that you feel safe so that you can be honest and open with your behavioral health provider. Telemental health is one of the most important divisions of telemedicine. It's embraced by physicians and appreciated by patients. It was one of the first disciplines that started using digital technology as a tool to deliver care. Among the many benefits of telemedicine, these are the most evident. Cutting costs of healthcare delivery. Making medical treatment available to more people, especially those who live in rural areas. Improving the patient experience and upgrading the quality and the availability of specialty care. There are four primary advantages to using telemedicine in mental health care. Alleviation of a concerning shortage of mental health providers. The avoidance of stigma that's often imposed on patients with mental health problems. Improvement in addiction treatment and recovery and improvement of accessibility to mental health care. And of these advantages, access to care stands out as a leading reason that telemental health is possible. The United States has been experiencing a shortage of mental health specialists for quite a while now. And the question remains, is it an absence of interest for the profession? Or is it the rapid increase in mental and emotional problems in the population that's causing the shortage? Regardless of the case, the shortage of mental health professionals affects an alarming number of Americans. That reality becomes even more disturbing when combined with the fact that one in five Americans experience a mental health illness every year. 
More than half of those affected do not get proper treatment, which could relate to the suicide rate increasing significantly in the last decade. And what seems to be missing is early diagnosis and treatment of mental health disorders that help prevent issues from escalating in the first place. While the, with the help of telemedicine, uh, patients are likely to access care from areas outside of their community so that they don't have to spend significant amounts of time traveling. Telehealth providers from anywhere in the country can jump in and they can offer assistance to local mental health specialists or they can even take over the patients entirely. The continuity of care and a strong doctor-patient relationship is essential for the successful treatment of mental and behavioral health problems. With a remote care, patients can stick to the provider and the, the therapy that they trust and that they benefit from. Let's talk now about the obstacles that come with digital health. How the mass adoption of telehealth affects access, cost, and quality of mental health and substance use disorders remains to be seen. Telehealth can provide a way to improve access to mental health and substance use disorder care, particularly for people living in rural areas with fewer providers. However, differences in comfort with technology, Digital literacy and a lack of internet at home may hinder access to telehealth for some. So the potential drawbacks of telehealth include access to, access to technology. So some, service, some services may be limited by a lack of internet connection and devices. Two, quality issues. So varying levels of technology and quality they can affect how services are provided and received. Three, cost. Evolving technology means updating equipment, platforms, and networks for patients. And finally, for privacy. Cameras in users' homes and virtual online platforms pose privacy considerations. Individuals also might be more hesitant to share um, sensitive personal information with a provider in situations where others might overhear. Mental health concerns are rapidly growing on a global scale, yet the shortage of mental health professionals and access to treatment um, is leaving millions left to fend for themselves. Unfortunately, there are several obstacles that prevent people with mental illnesses from seeking treatment. And those are, well, number one, sometimes technology is just not always cooperative, um, like losing Wi-Fi for three hours when it just worked earlier in the day. Two, sometimes you can lose vital aspects of therapy by reduced ability to see and to hear both verbal and nonverbal communications with the client. Although three, the third uh, obstacle is that although providers can assure client confidentiality, confidentiality on their end, they can't assure that clients are doing the best job to maintain their confidentiality themselves. So providers must educate clients to ensure their own confidentiality. Four, since the client isn't in the provider's office, providers can't control the environment. The client might have interruptions during the session, like a dog barking or kids running around in the background. The fifth, the fifth obstacle is if using text-based therapy, therapists cannot see facial expressions or vocal signals or even body language. And these signals can often be quite telling to give the therapist a clear picture of the client's feelings, thoughts, moods, and behaviors. Some delivery methods such as voice over internet technologies and video chats can provide a clearer picture of the situation, but they often lack the intimacy and intricacy that real world interactions offer. Six, 
Online therapy eliminates geographic restraints, making the enforcement of legal and ethical codes difficult. Therapists can treat clients from anywhere in the world, but many states have different licensing requirements and treatment guidelines. It's important to confirm a therapist's qualifications and experience, and experience before beginning the treatment process. And lastly, uh, and lastly, uh, e-therapy can be used for a variety of situations, but not when it comes to people that require close and direct treatment or in-person intervention. So for example, if a client has a serious addiction or more severe or complex symptoms of a mental health condition, Online therapy may not be recommended unless other in-person therapies or treatment are also involved in the care plan. The scope of online therapy can be limited, so it may not be effective for more complex situations. So although generally online therapy can be an effective and convenient way to access mental health services, it doesn't mean that it's right for everybody. Let's go to the next slide improvements to telemental health. Okay. We can look at the current challenges of the telehealth space to find where to start with improving the, tele the telehealth experience for everybody. For starters, Creating a wider access to the internet allows telehealth to reach more people who may not have options available to them. In fact, the Biden administration recently secured commitments from 20 leading internet service providers to either reduce prices or increase speeds to serve low income households. And this is a great step in the right direction. Better cellular and internet speeds allow for more telehealth experiences to be held over video and not telephonically. And this allows mental health professionals to better assess their patients through both verbal and nonverbal cues. With all of the advancements and changes that we've seen in technology in the last few decades, there, are, there is a lot for patients and providers to keep up with. And education is key to making sure that telehealth sticks around and continues to rise in availability. Many providers are willing to learn to, uh, a new technology, but they need to be trained by people that thoroughly understand the ins and the outs of the system. As new standards of care are set by technological advancements, Providers and patients alike need to be provided the education to keep up with these evolving standards. It's important for those implementing new systems to deliver proper education, um, and providers need to learn the technology as well as to be able to assist their patients. And another thing to consider is how to assist patients with disabilities through telehealth. There are laws in place in the U.S. to ensure the, equi the equality in care for those with and without disabilities. And therefore, considerations need to be made in telehealth situations as well, such as providing additional instructions or scheduling longer appointment times. Sometimes added support or modifications need to be made to technology systems in order to support these patients. Telehealth systems should meet the accessibility requirements and should provide resources that are available in multiple formats, such as audio recordings or large text sizes. Now, let's talk about what mental health telemedicine options uh, practitioners have. There's many ways to incorporate telemedicine into mental health practice. Providers can choose the best option depending on their needs and the requirements of their patients. The, the four common services that mental health practitioners provide through telemedicine are one, hospital care. So this service is frequent in rural or remote areas. 
In case of an emergency, mm -hmm. psychologists can diagnose and treat patients remotely since acute conditions need in-person supervision, available medical personnel can cooperate in the treatment under the guidance of a remote-based specialist. Two, on-demand service. So on-demand service usually mimics the traditional psychotherapy session. The patients can access the provider directly and receive treatment from their home with a virtual visit. It allows patients to cut travel time and schedule visits when it's convenient. It also helps avoid the stigma that accompanies even the most common of mental health issues. Third, access to primary care. So primary health care providers can enable patients to connect with behavioral health specialists from the office or clinic. This is an effective form of treatment because it applies a multidisciplinary and integrated approach. It's often used in areas with poor internet connections or if patients cannot receive treatment at home for various reasons. And finally, number four, remote monitoring programs. Mental health telemedicine providers can use smart mobile devices to observe patients and their behavioral patterns in real time. It is beneficial for monitoring emotional or cognitive issues as they happen. Remote monitoring programs are also helpful in, in children's behavioral therapy. With the help of telemedicine, patients are likely to access care from areas outside of their community so that they don't have to spend significant amounts of time traveling. Telehealth providers from anywhere in the country can jump in and offer assistance to local mental health specialists, or they can take over the care entirely. Now, let's review the key takeaways of this presentation. Teletherapy providers have seen a record uptake since March 2020, and the need for mental health support appears to be growing as patients confront the stress of the pandemic and social crises. There has been growth in mental health services across the board, but there has also been a notable increase in virtual visits among groups who have not been known for embracing mental health care in the past. And as the market rapidly grows, the upside is that digital mental health is getting much needed investment. Okay, and this concludes the lecture portion of the video, video conference. Are there any questions? Thank you all I, uh, for a very informative uh, presentation. I hope everyone found it uh, as helpful as I did. So since the presentation is over, we uh, can take any questions right now. You can uh, unmute your audio and ask the question or send the question in the chat box. We uh, just wanted to note that this presentation and webinar is recorded and will be available on all our social media channels within a week from today. So follow us to stay connected with us for future events and to also uh, check out the presentation recordings. We'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions. Again, you may unmute or ask a question in the chat box. And also like everyone that participated in this webinar, thank you for your time. Uh, one question we have is how to deal with situations where the, the patient or the person is at home and someone from his family overheard that person's conversation with his uh, therapist or, um, and then that family member comes to you uh, talking about that patient. 
Well, that's a good question. And that is, especially when um, telemental health started, there was quite a bit of concern about confidentiality on the patient's end, because it is true. But we all know that at a home, we have people coming in and out of our rooms quite often, and that the walls are not as, uh, it, the privacy is not as protected, and you can often overhear conversations or bits of conversations. So part of that, uh, and part of the answer to the, your question is the education that I talked about during the uh, presentation. Many psychologists will talk to their patients and say, try to be as private as possible. Let's try and schedule an appointment um, when others aren't home, maybe when your spouse or your children is home. So the likelihood of overhearing a conversation diminishes. And, but I think that you had another part to your question that I'm not quite answering. Do you want to elaborate on that about if somebody comes to you, is that the patient or somebody else? Uh, that somebody else, say the family member comes to you talking about that person's case, mm -hmm. uh, asking more questions about their um, either a child or spouse or whatever. Sure. You know, where in the United States, where that would come into play is, frankly, your treatment relationship is only with the individual. So let's say that I am that I'm talking to a therapist and my spouse overhears and that spouse reaches out to the therapist, regardless of the situation, whether they overhear our conversation in the home or maybe they're outside of the waiting area in a provider's office, protocol does not vary. Providers are not able to talk about their patient's um, treatment without the consent of the patient. So at that point, you would just defer to regular protocol, which is you cannot discuss anything that may have been overheard with the individual, with um, uh, uh, overheard unless the client gives consent. Right. Thank you for responding. Um, we wait to see if we have any more questions. We give it a couple minutes. We have one question. How to avoid negative stigma in patient with mental health problems? So is that ways to avoid negative stigma? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that is a that's a that's a really good question, and it's something that we have struggled with for years and years. Um, one of the ways that I think that we've seen stigma possibly reducing, at least in the United States, but also various countries are, uh, and it's not necessarily related to telehealth, but it's more awareness <laughs> of the problems that exist. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that one in five Americans are die, um, have a mental health issue each year or annually. And so having awareness for how frequent these and how pervasive these problems are has we're hoping will diminish the stigma um, because it's not a hidden disorder so many people suffer from it so we're hoping that if we uh, do better campaigning and better uh, better outreach to the public of the need for mental health treatment for this very pervasive problem that many of us suffer from, that this may reduce the stigma. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, another way uh, I will kind of piggyback off of both questions. So if there are concerns with stigma, some things that people have done that the virtual world, um, virtual therapy lends itself to is providing an additional opportunity for family members to speak with a therapist. So again, this would have to go with, uh, um, this would have to come with permission from the client, but I've seen families 
even close friends or loved ones come and talk to the therapist as well uh, at, at the early stages of their um, treatment, just to address any kind of questions or concerns that it may have. And again, hoping that it alleviates um, some of the barriers to care for the, for the client, if they have the support of their family and their friends. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have one more question. Uh, will virtual mental health be more available globally than just in the US? Yeah, I we're definitely seeing that. Um, internationally, there are programs that it is rising in pop popularity as well, telemental health. Um, and particularly, we see we've seen it more in disaster areas. We've seen telemental health uh, practices, or emergency telemental health response be erected, but we're also seeing more routine appointments for a video conference chat and some apps also um, raising internationally. So that is something to um, that is something to applaud. We definitely have still problems with provider. So at the time, it's generally, unless it's an emergency situation, providers in the U.S. have a hard time uh, delivering care remotely or vice versa because of state, uh, state, um, uh, what do I call it, um, compliance laws and, and uh, accreditation laws of therapists. So that's still a hurdle that we have to overcome. Thank you. I hope that answered the, the question. And let me just be a little more specific. Interstate licensure was the word that I was trying to find, but I lost for a minute. So interstate or international licensure uh, laws mm -hmm. are still quite restrictive in that area. Uh, from your experience, any mental health care studies uh, that came out this year we should keep an eye for? Oh, boy, that's a great question. I don't have studies off the top of my head, but I I will push. I, I'm a editor at the Journal for Telemedicine and eHealth. So I'll tell you one thing. I don't have specific studies. And one of the things that we're always looking for is more outcome studies, which we're getting more and more all the time, um, just as an uh, to kind of go back in the literature about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, most of the studies that were coming out for telemental health were satisfaction or acceptability studies. And now we're seeing more actual outcome studies, such as the cost effectiveness, such as long-term treatment outcomes. So I don't have one that has come out that I can think of in the last year, mm -hmm. but you know, with especially with COVID, there has been a drastic increase in in the literature uh, submissions this year that we've met, that are fairly unprecedented uh, because so many more people have experiences with telemedicine and we're able to measure it from the onset of the COVID ep epidemic. So we will be seeing quite a few this year uh, outcome studies than we've ever seen in the past. Awesome, thank you. We take wait another minute or so. See if anyone has any more questions. Um, I believe there are no more questions. So, um, in case there are some questions, you can always contact us with your question. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining us today and a special thank you for our guest speaker for this great uh, presentation and webinar. I hope uh, we answered everyone's uh, questions today and uh, uh, see them. Just comments, that, all positive comments for you, Elizabeth. So uh, very happy to have you today with us and I hope everyone has a great 
rest of your day. Uh, just a reminder, uh, connect with us on social media. This webinar will be available to review within a week from today. And if you have any other questions for us, you can always email us. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Aya. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.